Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. 40k lore. Weapons of the Necrons. Sidearms. Ballistics. Tachyon Arrow. Also known as the Fakuon Arrow. The Silver Ass Rape. Mr. Pine Sized Powerhouse. The Necron Proverbial Middle Finger. The One Punch Arrow. Strong enough to make an Exitus rifle look limp. I cannot believe this puny thing has more firepower than some titan weaponry. Comma ETC. ETC. Yada. 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 You get the idea. A Tachyon Arrow is an intricate Necron wrist mounted directed energy weapon worn by Necron royalty like Necron overlords, Necron lords and Necron destroyer lords. When activated, it transmutes a sliver of inert metal into an unstoppable thunderbolt capable of piercing the heart of a mountain. Such a weapon has near infinite range, and is able to penetrate almost any form of armor, including that of titans. The only disadvantage to this astounding item is that its strange ammo supply is exhausted with a single shot, and is far too complex to be reloaded in the midst of combat. If you have a need of a small, wrist-mounted sidearm that can make Emperor Battle Titans bend over in shame, there are always the Necrons to have your back. It is canon that a Necron Overlord has fired a Tachyon Arrow at a Warlord Titan, striking its reactors and causing it to detonate. Directed Energy. In Mythic Weapons. In Mythic Weapons are a new type of Necron Weapons. What these things are, we have no fucking clue as the word in Mythic does not exist in the English language. The closest we could get is that it may be spawned from the word Enigmatic, which essentially means mysterious. Which basically tells us nothing about these guns. Enmity is also a word, meaning the quality of being an enemy, something with enmity could be described as in Mythic. This also tells us precisely nothing about these guns. From the 9th Ed Necron Codex, Enmitic weapons creates pulses which when hit causes the victim's atoms to be repelled from each other violently. Functionally the same as Necron Gorse weapons, both are disintegration rays, but more violent. Imagine something akin to the District 9 microwave gun. Still have no idea why it's called Enmitic however. They obviously turn friendly and connected atoms into terrible enemies. And two enemy atoms in close proximity get so mad that they turn the other way in order to avoid each other. Genius GW strikes again. In Mythic Disintegrator Pistol. The small kid brother of the family. The In Mythic Disintegrator Pistol, S, are the main weapons of the Gunslinger Extraordinaire, the Hexmark Destroyer. The Destroyer holds six of these bad boys, allowing the destroyer to go guns blazing like something out of an old western. Nevertheless, as a pistol, its range ain't impressive, although its effective firing range is the same as the much larger in Mythic Annihilator. So pound for pound, it has a faster fire rate than its big bro. Rules wise, the in Mythic Disintegrator pistol is an 18 pistol 1 weapon. Pretty long range for a pistol. It is S6 and AP1 allowing it to punch straight through mechs, trust us, with the buffed Primaris Marines, that is a good thing, whilst dealing 1 damage per shot. Whilst that 1 damage may not sound like a lot, do take note that the Hexmark Destroyer has, and I shall repeat, 6 of these damned things. 6 shots equal by by Primaris Marines sadly you're averaging 1 dead Marine per turn, 2 dead Marines on a really good roll, and even then only if your exploding dice are equally good. Particle Caster. A Particle Caster is a Necron pistol weapon that emits a stream of minuscule antimatter particles which detonate on contact with normal matter. Because of the great potential damage they can inflict despite their small size, Particle Casters are most often paired with a close combat weapon. Triarch Praetorians commonly make use of Particle Casters paired with Void Blades as an alternative armament from their usual choice of the two-handed Rod of Covenant. Canoptic Wraiths can also be armed with Particle Casters. In 8th edition, Particle Casters are your Bolt Pistol equivalents to the Necron Army. Currently available only to the above-mentioned Wraiths and Void Blade wielding Praetorians, this differs from its puny Imperial counterpart by being S6. Despite being extremely powerful for its size, it is still no Tachyon Arrow. Particle Beamer. 
A particle beamer is the large father of the particle caster. For when the particle caster just doesn't cut enough cheese for your liking. Particle beamers are heavy, rifle sized particle weapons, and can cause powerful blasts at range to decimate enemy infantry. Tomb blades can mount a particle beamer on their chassis instead of their usual twin linked Tesla carbines, whilst Canoptex spitters who specialize in sentinel duties commonly mount twin linked particle beamers on their backs. Tesseract arcs are also able to mount two particle beamers as secondary weapon systems. On tabletop, the particle beamer is the bigger brother of the particle caster. This gun is an assault 6 version with double the range. Available as a singleton for tomb blades or taken in pairs on tesseract arcs and canoptex spitters. While a sixth of your base cost to equip to a spike, scouring eye. The scouring eye is the name given to the giant cyclopean eyes of the necron cryptothralls. Not much is really known about these weapons other than the fact that the cryptothralls can shoot them out like some sort of X-Men cyclops. Seeing as how even Lexiconum lacks a page for these things, your guess on whether they are some sort of gorse, tesla or in mythic weapon is as good as ours. Dimensional. Transdimensional beamer. Transdimensional beamers are pretty cool necron weapons that, instead of using the warp to chuck their enemies into space hell like some races, uses other spatial dimensional pocket spaces to jettison their targets in an inaccessible void. Whilst originally designed as a convenient method of banishing unwanted debris, machinery, failed experiments, toilet paper, used tampons, dog litter and rubbish bags from tomb worlds and battlefields into a pocket dimension outside of the normal space-time continuum. One certain Necron Lord thought to himself that wouldn't it be a great idea to use that on our foes as well? Well. We later found out it could as the transdimensional beamer can be used just as easily to exile and banish foes to a long and horrifying death from starvation and the same extra dimensional garbage pile. Transdimensional beamers take on the form of small pistol weapons, and are most commonly used by Canoptic wraiths to aid them in their maintenance of a Necron tomb world. The Cryptic Oricon the Diviner makes use of a transdimensional beamer as his primary sidearm. Basic Weapons Directed Energy. Gorse Flare. The trusty Gorse Flare is the standard weapon, in fact, the only weapon, until the 9th edition that is, wielded by Necron Warriors. Gorse Flares are rifle-like weapons used by Necron armies. They consist of a metal stock, a transparent tube containing the unholy and unknown energy the weapon fires, and an axe-like bayonet underneath the muzzle. The weapons fire green, lightning-like beams at the enemy, which strip the targets away molecule by molecule. It is, supposedly, extremely painful to be shot with a gorse flare, and victims die as much from shock as the damage caused by the beams. The gorse flare as pictured on the right, had the classic green rod look before it was superseded in 9th edition by the more ornate type present in the other examples. Its stats are equivalent to the bolter, with the additional gorse rule mentioned above. Ghost Arcs and Doomsday Arcs mount an array of 5 of these guns on each side, while the Canoptic Doomstalker has a single pair of them for self-defense. Gorse Reaper. A Gorse Flare with 2 barrels that is differentiated from the Gorse Blaster by having the barrels be much shorter. The Tradiaf is that it sacrifices range for increased hitting power. Despite its looks, it should not be confused with the Gorse Blaster. Introduced in 9th as an alternative weapon for Necron Warriors, it possesses an extra pip of strength and AP in exchange for being a Salt 2 with a range of 12. I. E. The same as the rapid fire mode of the Gorse Flare. This makes it a better fit for deep striking groups of warriors intending to get dropped in the backside of the enemy to roast them with green fire. For your mainline warrior blobs, it's more of a debate as getting all of them in range from the middle of the field is a greater hassle and significantly weaker fire is better than no fire. Thankfully, you can mix and match within the unit. Until you consider the fact it has no cool axe head or proper beefy bayonet, which makes it objectively worse. At least it has two prongs. Tesla Carbine. A Tesla Carbine is a form of Necron Tesla weapon that unleashes a bolt of living Viridian lightning that crackles from foe to foe after hitting its target, charring flesh and melting armor. Tesla bolts feed off the energy released by the destruction, and the lightning discharge becomes more furious with every fresh arc, moving as if it had a mind of its own. In some cases, 
These energetic projectiles have even been observed to crack ceramite and plasteel. Somehow, the Imperium still remembers the name of Nikola Tesla, thus they named these weapons after him. A Tesla carbine is the smallest form of Tesla weapon, and its rifle, the damn thing is as big as the wielder. Comma size makes it easily portable. A unit of immortals or tomb blades can choose to use Tesla carbines instead of gorse blasters, sacrificing the gorse rule and 4 plus armor piercing ability for the chance to land extra hits. Special weapons. Incendiary. Gauntlet of Fire. A gauntlet of fire is a Necron weapon that takes the form of an armored glove and vambrace, that is to say a gauntlet, that crackles and flows with viridian flame. The gauntlet's mechanisms are controlled by a series of submechadermal filaments, giving the wielder a level of control over the gauntlet flamer as fine as that over his own hand. A gauntlet of fire is capable of firing a great column of green flame, with similar effects compared to an imperial flamer. It can also be used in close combat in the form fiery fist that is more likely to hit and harm the foe, as well as set them alight for a time. Gauntlets of fire are weapons found exclusively as part of the armories of Necron royals which have a lord in their names such as Necron overlords, Necron lords, and Necron destroyer lords. Since it only fires in a flamerish template, do not expect your lord to be shooting fireballs and the like. He is only going to spill out fire like a normal flamer. Since it is kind of one of a kind in terms of appearance, without a blatantly obvious barrel to speak of like the Famastorm gauntlet, this gauntlet does raise a question on where the flame part of the flamer actually comes from. If you look closely at the palm, there is a small nozzle which presumably projects out the fire in question. The spherical crest thingy on the back of the hand is likely the mind-bogglingly advanced fuel source which may last until the end of time before it needs to be swapped. As far as the tabletop's concerned, it is a flamer that also allows its user to reroll to hit and to wound in melee. So, why don't you remember it? Because any decent melee fighting Necron is not going to leave his war scythe at home, duh. You may see some more in 7th now that they can bring both. As of 8th edition's index Xenos 1, nobody else can take one except our Imatech here. Other. Synaptic Disintegrator. A sniper rifle that can at best, turn you into Stephen Hawking and at worse, turn you into maggot food. A synaptic disintegrator is an advanced sniper weapon utilized only by Necron Deathmark assassins as their favorite weapon to deliver death from afar. These cruel long barreled rifles fire compressed leptonic beams of subatomic particles which destroy neural and synaptic tissue. Beginning within the target's brain and spreading in microseconds throughout their entire body, molecules unbond with one another, causing the luckless target to crumple limply to the ground like a puppet with its strings severed. Synaptic disintegrators are capable of sustaining a rate of fire at long range, even when the wielder is on the move, that few other sniper weapons can match. Those killed by the first shot from a synaptic disintegrator are the fortunate ones, for a hit from the weapon that is less than fatal almost invariably leaves the victim an echo of his former self, his neural tissue utterly destroyed and his mind torn apart. May or may not be an advanced version of the neuro disruptor and the neural shredder, Heavy Weapons. Directed Energy. Gorse Blaster. A Gorse Flare was given the multi-melter treatment, that is, get two of the same gun and then Mac Jiver all over it. The Gorse Blaster is the standard weapon of Necron Immortals. Gorse Blasters fire more powerful beams than Gorse Flares, and are extremely potent against infantry and light vehicles alike. Despite its looks, it should not be confused with the Gorse Reaper. Necron pariahs also make use of a form of inbuilt gorse blaster integrated into their war scythes. Unfortunately, pariahs no longer exist thanks to this loser, so the days of war scythes gorse blaster combo is a thing of long lost past. It is basically a gorse flare with slightly improved strength and armor piercing capability, 4 micro dimensions, for when you need several universes to simultaneously hate the same thing. A unit of Tomb Blades can also choose to take twin linked pairs of them to specialize in vehicle hunting. Gorse Cannon. The iconic weapon of Necron Destroyers is their shoulder mounted Gorse Cannon, however, both Catacomb Command Barges and Annihilation Barges are able to mount an Andreslung Gorse Cannon instead of their usual Tesla Cannon. In addition, Tesseract Arcs can mount a pair as Sponson Guns, 
for extra mech killing power. Though it's only as strong and long range as a gorse blaster, it is overall a larger version of the gorse blaster and has 4 barrels, providing it with an even higher rate of fire and because of its mounting on a heavier base, it has greater power over a greater distance. Also due to its mount it is able to be fired and redeployed very quickly. It has more shots and will tear through all but the toughest armor suits. Gorse Destructor. A new weapon found in the Locklust Heavy Destroyer. The Gorse Destructor seemed to largely replace the Gorse Cannon or Heavy Gorse Cannon as its spiritual successor. Unlike its predecessors, the Gorse Destructor is not shoulder mounted, instead, it is held by three hands like any Jenna Stealer heavy weapon. On the tabletop in 9th edition, the Gorse Destructor is the Locklust Heavy Destroyer's primary anti-tank option. It is a 36 heavy one weapon that is S10 and AP4. This stats allow it to breach any hull of any vehicle, up to and including, super heavies. It also makes any unit that does not have a 2 plus SV to take an instant wound, so there's that too. It deals 3d3 damage, so have fun throwing, on average 4-6 wounds per shot. Heavy Gorse Cannon. Necron Heavy Destroyers get Heavy Gorse Cannons, and Triarch Stalkers can choose a twin linked set of them as a primary weapon. They only get one shot, but it's as powerful as a Lys Cannon. These Gorse weapons have been known to hurt monstrous creatures that similar weapons have no hope of even scratching, and have also been documented tearing at the armor of even the most heavily armored of tanks and starship hulls with ease. The Imperium of Man is confounded by the nature of the energy used by these weapons, not only because the basic weaponry of the Necrons can cause great harm to even the most advanced vehicles deployed by the armed forces of the Imperium, but also because by all the physical principles known, these weapons should overheat and malfunction as a result of the tremendous energies they unleash, destroying the warrior who is firing them. It is a larger version of the Gorse Cannon, although it only has one barrel and so a slow rate of fire. Though it has the greatest power and range, its reduced rate of fire makes it less effective against vast armies, but more effective against certain heavily armored targets, such as land raiders. So when people meant that the Necrons can blow up your land raider with their most simple weapons, this is the gun they usually specify. Heavy Gorse Cannon. Necron Heavy Destroyers get Heavy Gorse Cannons, and Triarch Stalkers can choose a twin linked set of them as a primary weapon. They only get one shot, but it's as powerful as a Lys Cannon. These Gorse weapons have been known to hurt monstrous creatures that similar weapons have no hope of even scratching, and have also been documented tearing at the armor of even the most heavily armored of tanks and starship hulls with ease. The Imperium of Man is confounded by the nature of the energy used by these weapons, not only because the basic weaponry of the Necrons can cause great harm to even the most advanced vehicles deployed by the armed forces of the Imperium, but also because by all the physical principles known, these weapons should overheat and malfunction as a result of the tremendous energies they unleash, destroying the warrior who is firing them. It is a larger version of the Gorse Cannon, although it only has one barrel and so a slow rate of fire. Though it has the greatest power and range, its reduced rate of fire makes it less effective against vast armies, but more effective against certain heavily armored targets, such as land raiders. So when people meant that the Necrons can blow up your land raider with their most simple weapons, this is the gun they usually specify. Particle Beamer. A particle beamer is the large father of the particle caster. For when the particle caster just doesn't cut enough cheese for your liking, Particle beamers are heavy, rifle sized particle weapons, and can cause powerful blasts at range to decimate enemy infantry. Tomb blades can mount a particle beamer on their chassis instead of their usual twin linked Tesla carbines, whilst Canoptex spitters who specialize in sentinel duties commonly mount twin linked particle beamers on their backs. Tesseract arcs are also able to mount two particle beamers as secondary weapon systems. In Mythic Annihilator, the Enmitic Annihilator is a type of Necron weapon used by Scorpec Lords. It is the only known ranged weapon of the Scorpec Lord and is considered as the plasma cannon of the family. Despite this, the sheer unit of the Scorpec Lord makes the weapon appear and function more like a pistol. Despite this, it falls short of the horde beat stick known as the Enmitic Exterminator, so it is treated more as a support weapon than the primary gun. Enmitic Exterminator. 
In Mythic Exterminator is a type of Necron weapon used by Locust Destroyers and are the big proverbial fuckstick of the family. Looking like a giant brick filled with a bundle of glowing PCP pipes. This six-barreled fuck-off cannon is used to completely ass-rape whoever pissed off the local overlord in the morning. Staff Weapons. Directed Energy. Eldritch Lance. The closest thing the Necrons have to a plasma cannon. The Eldritch Lance is a very special staff wielded by the drinker of strawberry smoothies. The Eldritch Lance is capable of emitting a beam of furious annihilating energy at significant ranges. The passage of this beam makes the air seem to hiss as it turns into plasma, and its power makes a staff of light, already a potent weapon, seem like little more than a child's toy. The Eldritch Lance's beam is most effective when used to incinerate armored vehicles and heavily armored infantry, for only the heaviest forms of vehicle armor are able to stop its passage without being vaporized. For those rare cases when Ceres enemies survive long enough to engage him in close combat, the Eldritch Lance can be wielded in a manner akin to a spear, albeit with effects on flesh and armor similar to those caused by power weapons. Entropic Lance. The Swirling Orb of Death itself. An Entropic Lance is one of two staves Chronomancers can carry to war, the other being the Eon Stave. Unlike its cousin, which fires smaller, but no less lethal blots of temporal fury, the Entropic Lance focuses this into one eviscerating beam, that causes entropy itself to eat away at and destroy its target. While it can be used as a melee weapon, and it can command the power of time in such a way that the weapon is lethal both at range and in close combat, the weapon will cause more havoc upon its target from a long distance. Rod of Covenant. He most common of the Necron staves and the only one that is wielded by lesser Necron classes. The Rod of Covenant is a short range projectile and melee weapon used by high ranked non royal Necrons, most commonly Triarch Praetorians. Within the head of each weapon is caged a roiling fragment of a dying star bound within a potent force field. A blast from a Rod of Covenant can reduce even another Necron to a smoldering pool of metal, while organic creatures simply explode into clouds of flaming ash. It also generates an energy field, enabling it to be used as a power weapon. Staff of Light. A Staff of Light is a device of arcane Necron technology that serves as both a symbol of rank and authority, as well as a potent weapon for Necron royals. Shaped like a traditional Necron staff with an ornate headpiece, its haft is actually a disguise power generator rod, and the crest a finely tuned focusing device which allows the wielder to unleash searing bolts of iridian energy at a rapid rate towards the enemy. Despite sounding a lot like gorse weaponry, the Staff of Light makes an exception among Necron technology. Instead of using gorse technology principles, it absorbs energy from thin air to release in the form of powerful lightning bolts. A secondary effect of the energy is a steep decrease in the temperature around the wielder, the cold freezes the limbs of the opponents, mechanical or not, who shatters when hit by the staff. These beams are so potent that they are even capable of penetrating a start's power armor with ease. As well as being capable of projecting devastating blasts of energy at range, a Staff of Light also serves a similar function to a power weapon in close combat. Later versions sport a fractal edge blade on the top of the staff for increased damage. Staff of the Destroyer. Imatek's personal pimp cane and one of the most powerful Necron staves. Basically a doomsday cannon on a stick. The Staff of the Destroyer is an ancient and ornamental Necron staff weapon carried by the Farron Imatek the Stormlord, though it was first wielded by Zehat, the founder of the Zehat dynasty. It has since been wielded by all of Zehat's successors, and has seen battle in the hands of every one. The Staff of the Destroyer is not only a symbol of his august rank for Imatek, but also an unbelievably powerful weapon. Upon the battlefield, it can unleash a searing beam of pan-dimensional energy that can make a mockery of even the most heavily armored foes. However, there is a small consolation for Imitex enemies, as the staff takes a significant amount of time to recharge its power for another blast. Trazin has attempted to steal it. Twice. Voltaic Staff. A Necron Staff crossed with a Tesla weapon. The Voltaic Staff is a Necron weapon. It looks similar to a Staff of Light but electromagnetic energy continuously crackles along the length of its shaft and arcs between the exposed storage crystals that make up the headpiece. The user can unleash this energy at will as crackling tendrils of living lightning, 
and where one finds its mark, the others won't be far behind. An ideal weapon for the cryptic or noble who wishes to demonstrate the superiority of Necron technology to the lesser races of the galaxy, the impossibly high voltages emitted by the staff are capable of being fired at extremely rapid rates. The lightning-like energies unleashed by a voltaic staff are especially effective against vehicles, as the application of high voltage is enough to disrupt the function of even the most sophisticated forms of technology. Just as a Necron Overlord or Cryptek commands a Voltaic Staff, so does the Voltaic Staff command the power of the storm itself. Other. Abyssal Staff. An Abyssal Staff is a Necron weapon used only by Cryptek Psychomancers. Basically a Necron Flamer weapon except when it's not. An Abyssal Staff is capable of summoning gouts of shadow that are emitted in a similar way to how flames may be emitted from an Imperial Flamer. However, to succumb to the swirling ebon mists and shroud of despair called by an abyssal staff is to be swallowed in impenetrable madness, for it is designed to strike at the sanity of the foe and sap their willpower to live, thus causing enemies to be turned into gibbering wrecks of their former selves if they are not slain outright by the experience. To simplify, it is a necron neuro disruptor that behaves like a flamer and looks like a staff. Eon Stave. A pretty cool and weird staff that controls the power of time. Well, only on a limited scale for obvious reasons. An Eon Stave is a Necron weapon used only by Cryptic Chronomancers. Taking on the appearance of a simple stave with an ornate head, the sapphire crystalline headpiece of an Eon Stave contains a massive chronal charge that, when unleashed, can trap a foe in a bubble of slow time for an extended period of time, severely degrading the enemy's physical capabilities and power to defend himself. This is because each blow from an Eon Stave generates a low level stasis field that encapsulates the foe and moves him outside the flow of the normal space time continuum. Empathic Obliterator. The staff belonging to everyone's favorite troll, Crazy the Incontinent. When an enemy is slain by the staff, a psionic shockwave bursts forth from his her body, potentially killing nearby creatures of a similar mind and purpose. Hence. An entire squad can be wiped out with a single blow of this lousy weapon. The Empathic Obliterator suits the personal combat style of Trazin as he disdains physical combat with inferior beings of flesh and blood. It is also rumored to be that the staff contains technology derived from that of the long extinct old ones, which, given that this is Trazin, is most likely the case. Staff of Tomorrow. A unique and legendary staff made specifically for Auric and the Diviner made out of Timmy Wimmy staff. This unique example of advanced Necron time manipulation technology exists a fraction of a second ahead of any given moment in the normal space-time continuum. This property allows Auric to strike at his target an instant before the foe even moves to do so. The staff of tomorrow can also penetrate all known forms of infantry armor, in a similar way to a power weapon further enhancing its devastating effect in melee. For all intents and purposes, it is the choppier counterpart to the Eon Stave. However, there doesn't seem to have any sort of range attack unlike the others, instead its power rests in its temporal displacement. Tremor Stave. A staff that hits like a demolisher cannon. A Tremor Stave is a Necron weapon used only by Cryptek Geomancers. Its shaft encloses numerous gyro engines gravitic flux generators, and other sophisticated devices to form a weapon as deadly as it is unconventional. When a cryptic drives the tip of his tremor stave into the ground, a wave of seismic energy is released, traveling in a straight line directly towards his intended target, splitting the very ground open and sending shards of stone and sprays of dirt blasting out with deadly velocity. The fissure created by the tremor stave is approximately 1 meter wide, and enemies standing nearby are hit by an invisible concussive energy wave. When the wave reaches its target point within a range of roughly 50 meters from the cryptic, it explodes with fantastic force in a wide area, leaving behind a large crater. The force is unleashed by a tremor stave can plunge enemies to their deaths, whilst knocking survivors sprawling from the sudden quake. Vehicle Weapons Directed Energy. Death Ray. The Necron Death Ray are the closest thing the Krons have to a laser weapon. Contrary to GW's lack of scientific wisdom, the Death Ray's lasers actually behave more like a proper laser should unlike the more iconic Laskin. That is, it fires a white, 
Blinding light of semi-invisible photons rather than the usual red pew-pews you see in every sci-fi franchise ever. A death ray is a ferocious necron weapon most commonly found as the primary weapon for doom scythes. The death ray is aptly named and rightly feared, for there is seldom a warning before the weapon strikes, for any sound it makes is lost under the unearthly wailing of the doom scythe's engines. A particularly alert foe might recognize the nimbus of energy building up around the focusing crystal, or the abrupt change in air pressure, but few recognize the significance in time. The nimbus pulses one final time and a beam of blinding white light bursts from the doom scythe's underside, vaporizing infantry and tanks alike, leaving only charred and rutted terrain in its wake. A single doom scythe can carve its way through an entire armored column so long as its death ray remains operational and a full squadron can reduce the sprawling spires of a hive city to fulminating slag in less than an hour. Mountain as part of an underslung turret on a doom scythe, a death ray fires a narrow beam of intense energy capable of passing through many enemy units and vehicles before the energy is dissipated, often vaporizing whole battle lines with a single shot and leaving nothing but a line of ruin in its wake. Focused Death Ray. The Death Ray's much more dangerous cousin. A focused Death Ray is a ferocious Necron armament that is mounted as the primary weapon on a sentry pylon. The coruscating beams of force emitted by the focused Death Ray are able to slice through entire ranks of enemy soldiers and whole columns of armored battle tanks with contemptuous ease. Utilizing an advanced focusing array, a sentry pylon is able to project its crackling ray over far greater distances than previously encountered versions of the death ray weapon, and with a destructive potential that is efficiently effective. When fired, the narrow beam of intense thermal energy fired by a focused death ray will vaporize everything along its line of fire, and often passes through several enemy units before the energy finally dissipates, leaving nothing but a line of charred ruin in its wake. But what the focused death ray does best is its effectiveness against aircraft. The literal light speed attacks of the focused death ray means that it does not really need to take account of wind conditions, the planet's curvature and estimated distance between target and weapon that plagues most races anti-air batteries. It should be noted that the focused death ray looks extremely similar to the regular death ray, rather, the larger power source from the sentry pylon makes the weapon far more potent than its lesser cousin. Gorse Exterminator. A Gorse Exterminator is a large Gorse weapon mounted as the primary weapon on Necron sentry pylons. Similar in power to a heavy Gorse cannon, a Gorse Exterminator possesses a higher rate of fire and is able to engage targets at extreme ranges. Gorse Exterminators are also capable of using their sophisticated targeting systems to accurately track and fire upon aircraft at incomprehensibly long ranges. Exterminators are far larger than the more common gorse flares, gorse blasters and gorse cannons, and feature a single elongated barrel containing the unholy and unknown viridian energy the weapon fires. Gorse Flux Arc. The gorse flux arc is basically like the gorse flare, but firing more shots at a time by simply opening one enormous microdimension. Monolith mount one at each corner, ghost arcs mount one at each side and they are capable of choosing their targets independently. Gorse flux arcs come in the form of four automated turret projectors positioned around the vehicle's hull. Gorse flux arcs consist of linked batteries of three gorse flares, which each feature a single barrel that leads to a transparent conduit containing the unholy and unknown viridian energy the weapon fires, and an axe-like bayonet underneath the muzzle, even though the weapon is connected to a platform that would make the use of the bayonet pointless in the first place. Heat Cannon. What we see here is the Heat Ray's bigger brother. But since it is big enough to mount on a turret, it is now a cannon. The Heat Cannon is a Necron thermal energy weapon with qualities from appearance to destructive capability similar to that of the smaller Heat Ray, only much bigger, and it is one of the three primary weapon choices for a sentry pylon. Unlike the Heat Ray, however, it does not have a dispersed firing mode, and there really isn't any big reason to equip a static weapons platform with a flame cannon unless the feature is complementary. The heat cannon is a weapon of extraordinary power. This giant ray gun can reduce the most heavily armored tanks into piles of molten slag and burn its way through the most heavily protected fortifications at relatively great distances. With every beam it fires, 
It is capable of vaporizing everything in an area with a small blast, and its rate of fire allows it to continually bombard an area with impunity. By its capabilities, it is equivalent to the thermal cannon sported by the Quistoris Knights of the Imperium of Man. Speaking of which, their possible rendition of the Knight Errant is an interesting prospect, though since it is the Necrons we're talking about, the construct in question will probably have at least six legs and not two. Well, there are the Bone Giants, but that's their Tomb King's incarnation over Warhammer Fantasy. However, like two other two cannons of total destruction, the heat cannon might actually require a lot of power and space supported by the frame of a sentry pylon in order to operate. Heat Ray. This here is a weapon ripped straight out of age. G. Wells War of the Worlds in both name and possibly function. A heat ray is a multi-purpose Necron fusion weapon, that is, Melter, and it is most commonly mounted on Triox stalkers whose role is to engage heavy armor and provide close fire support. Heat rays are potent weapons in that they are capable of firing in two different modes just like those of the orcs. Unlike the Burnus, however, the Necron's cut in flame actually goes well beyond melee range. If an enemy tank stalls the main Necron attack, a single focused blast from the heat ray is sufficient to end the threat. Similarly, if Duggan infantry are hampering an advance, a Triox Stalker can break the deadlock by setting the heat ray to fire a dispersed beam sending a wide cone of scorching plasma swirling into every crevasse to boil the enemy alive. It's essentially a supped up standard Star Trek phaser. Whereas a focused beam is akin to a melter weapon with a significant range comparable to a multi-melter, the dispersed beam is more similar to a heavy flamer in terms of the potential damage it can inflict. Of note, this ability of changing between dispersed and focused firing modes is remarkably similar to another weapon of the salamanders. The Pyroclast Flame Projector. It seems Vulcan had been tinkering with Necron tech prior to the Horus Heresy, or that both him and the cannon found inspiration from the novel. Or he might have found inspiration from the Orcs instead. Fluff-wise, the burner of the Orcs is likely inspired by the heat ray of the Necrons, and hopefully not the other way around. Particle Shredder. The Lascanon of the Particle Weapons. Particle shredders can be likened to the role of the aforementioned heavy less cannon in size, and can output a far larger blast than the smaller particle beamer. A Triox Stalker can mount a particle shredder as its primary armament instead of its usual heat ray, transforming its combat role into that of a deadly infantry hunter. Like all particle weapons, it emits a stream of minuscule antimatter particles which detonate on contact with other matter. In 8th edition, the Particle Shredder is only available to Triox Stalkers. While heavy 6s7 AP 1d3 sounds reasonable the 24 range is a big letdown, and the other two weapons the Stalker has access to are considerably more useful. It is only dwarfed by the Colossal Particle Whip. Tesla Cannon. The Tesla Carbine's Lust Cannon. Like its smaller brethren, the Tesla Cannon is a form of Necron Tesla weapon that unleashes a large bolt of living Viridian lightning that crackles from foe to foe after hitting its target, charring flesh and melting armor. Tesla bolts feed off the energy released by the destruction, and the lightning discharge becomes more furious with every fresh arc, moving as if it had a mind of its own. In some cases, these energetic projectiles have even been observed to crack ceramides and plasteel. A Tesla cannon is a large Tesla weapon that is like a Tesla carbine with another point of strength and twice as many shots. It is found underneath of Annihilation barges and Catacomb Command barges operators pedals and acts as a secondary weapon. Tesseract arcs are also able to mount two Tesla cannons as secondary weapon systems for twice the rapi power. Tesla cannons are powerful weapons that are most effective against infantry squads and light vehicles. Tesseract Singularity Chamber. No, despite its name, it has nothing to do with it being a black hole cannon. The Tesseract Singularity Chamber is the main armament of the Tesseract Arc. It is essentially a shielded device which holds a sliver of a dying star within it, akin to a miniature aeonic orb. When activated, the Singularity Chamber is capable of a variety of rapatastic effects such as Silver Fire, Particle Hurricane, and Seismic Lash. However, like the aeonic orb, should the chamber be sufficiently damaged, there may be a catastrophic chain reaction. Thermal Cutting Beam. 
The thermal cutting beam is a Necron weapon only utilized by the insect-like constructs known as Canoptic Acanthrites. This cutting beam mounted within the Acanthrites thorax is capable of firing a short-range, highly concentrated shaft of thermic energy ray that is able to slice apart the toughest of materials, dissecting steel, stone and flesh with equal ease and precision of a surgeon's scalpel blade. Canoptic Acanthrites often use their cutting beams for the destruction of armored vehicles and troops, as well as the systematic and rapid dismemberment of bunkers and fortifications. Of note, unlike the similarly focused fire pike and heat lance of the Elder, the cutting beam of the Necrons is much more similar to that of a standard Meltigan, save for being far more focused and prolonged. This distinction doesn't make their effectiveness any better, though, because the cutting beam is more or less the same as any Meltigan out there. We may infer this similarity to the supposed function of these canoptic constructs. Acanthrites are deployed in swarms for the purpose of systematic disintegration of enemy fortifications and pretty much anything else that just has to be in their way. This means that the cutting beam is more akin to that of a precision tool for Necron mass demolitions job that just happens to be good at killing combatants who are encased in armor like a tank. In battle, this weapon worthy quality translates to the Acanthrites, being vanguard units, using them to soften up the enemy defenses for the following main forces to easily engage. Dimensional. Exile Cannon. The Exile Cannon uses technologies similar to those employed by the smaller transdimensional beamer, and is a Canoptic Tomb Sentinel's primary weapon. Thus, it can be said that the Exile Cannon is what happens when you scale a transdimensional beamer to vehicle sized. The results ain't pretty. An Exile Cannon is a powerful and arcane Necron weapon that functions exactly like the transdimensional beamer, just on a much logically bigger scale. How big we don't know. But seeing as how this thing can acerate tanks like there is no tomorrow, we can estimate that it is quite fucking big. Thus, it could be stated that the Exile Cannon is meant for heavy duty purposes when it comes to clearing unwanted trash dirtying the tomb world. Exile Cannons often form the head of the tomb sentinels. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Super Heavy Weapons. Directed Energy. Annihilator Beam. The Annihilator Beam is a giant fuck off weapon used as the primary armament of the Triangle Men his. It is unknown what this weapon is exactly, is it a juiced up gorse weapon or a doomsday cannon on steroids? We have no idea, what we do know is that the Annihilator Beam has one of the most appropriate sounding names. Cause this monster annihilates anything standing in its way. Seriously, banner blades and land raiders will roll for critical existence failure once these things are on the battlefield. Doomsday Cannon. Ah, ah. The Doomsday Cannon. The sweet, sweet Doomsday Cannon. This one part less cannon, one part plasma cannon, one part battle cannon and one part rail cannon is noted to be one of the most ridiculous guns available to the Necrons. Only found mounted on a doomsday arc, which is in itself nothing less than an enormous self-propelled doomsday cannon. This is a plasma weapon that can win a battle with a single shot. And most often, this can play through on even tabletop. Even fired at low power, a doomsday cannon is a fearsome weapon, when firing at full effect, its searing plasma beams burn many times hotter than more conventional plasma weapons. Infantry squads caught in the Doomsday Cannon's fury are obliterated instantly whilst armored vehicles are reduced to glowing slag. In the face of a shot from a Doomsday Cannon, nothing less than a Titan's Void Shields can hope to offer more than a fool's hope of protection. As overwhelming as the Doomsday Cannon is, fortunately there is a crutch, the weapon requires immense amounts of energy to fire. Due to the energy constraints that are inherent in the design of a Doomsday Arc, a Doomsday Cannon can only be fired at full power whilst the vehicle is not moving. 
This is because the weapon draws on the same power reserves as the repulsor engines of the vehicle. Any systems not directly pertaining to the Doomsday Ox main armament are part of the motive units that power its anti-gravitic engines and propel it into position, or the shielding arrays that give the vehicle some measure of protection from enemy fire. Each of these secondary systems draws power from the same source as the Doomsday Cannon, and much of the pilot's concentration is taken up ensuring that the energy distribution is appropriate to the tasks at hand. As a result, a Doomsday Cannon is somewhat less effective when fired during or immediately following any significant movement of the craft, due to the need for the pilots to redistribute power to the dimensional repulsor motive units that keep the Doomsday Arc aloft. This forces the Doomsday Cannon to receive less power and fire a weaker, though still powerful, blast. Then again, even a low power blast from a Doomsday Cannon rivals the most hallowed of Adeptus Astart's plasma cannons for destructive potential. Doomsday Blaster. A cousin of the Doomsday Cannon, the Doomsday Blaster is a heavy Necron weapon mounted on the top of the Canoptic Doomstalker. Unlike the regular Doomsday Cannon, the Doomsday Blaster has a more dial yield effect that allows it to switch from a widespread anti-blob exterminator to a more focused, turn a land raider inside out beam of as fuckery. This makes the weapon extremely versatile and lethal to anything not wearing void shields as standard issue. Gorse Annihilator. Basically an upscaled Gorse Exterminator, but instead of aircraft, it's everything. A Gorse Annihilator is one of the largest known forms of Gorse weapons, with the only Gorse weapon similar in size to it being the Gorse Obliterator. Gorse Annihilators are only ever found mounted on devastating Necron Gorse pylons. Like the smaller Sentry pylon, the shape of the both the weapon and machine itself is quite identifiable. A Gorse Annihilator consists of a single focusing crystal which leads to transparent tubes containing the unholy and unknown Viridian energy the weapon fires. This is combined with several focusing arrays and a pair of particle emitters mounted on the pylon's crescent shape to further empower the Gorse Annihilator beams. Gorse Annihilators are supremely powerful weapons, capable of a relatively fast rate of fire that can penetrate even Titan armor with ease, let alone vaporize smaller tanks. With good reason, too, in fluff these things are ground to orbital weapons with enough hurt to cripple cruisers in a single hit. Gorse Annihilators can also be fired as a flux arc similar to the Gorse flux arcs mounted on a monolith. However, a pylon's version is stronger and can even destroy space marines with comparable ease in a larger radius, as Gorse beams lance out all around it. Gorse Obliterator. The Glowing Crystal of Doom. A Gorse Obliterator is one of the largest known Gorse weapons, with the only Gorse weapon similar in size to it being the Gorse Annihilator. Gorse Obliterators are only found mounted on the Doomsday Monolith variant, where the weapon itself consists of a large focusing crystal leading to transparent conduits containing the unholy and unknown Viridian energy the weapon fires. Doomsday Monoliths can focus their awesome destructive energies into devastating beams which can be fired from its Gorse Obliterator, the beams themselves are capable of outright destroying infantry and vehicles alike. However, a Doomsday Monolith is inevitably accompanied by several lesser constructions, whose eldritch power it can siphon towards its own cataclysmic ends. This additional energy is drained from the power matrices of other monoliths and is discharged from the Gorse Obliterator in the form of additional blasts. This increases the weapon's rate of fire and all but ensures the doom of the enemy. Unfortunately, despite receiving a model, the Gorse Obliterator along with the Doomsday Monolith have not received any rules. Nevertheless, one could estimate that thing monstrosity would be the equivalent of a volcano cannon. Particle Whip. The biggest cheddar wheel in the block. A particle whip is unusual in that it only comes in the form of a large, glowing power matrix crystal mounted atop a monolith, the giant golf ball on the top. This is a totally different, far more static design than the more mobile barrel structure that characterizes other Necron particle weapons. Nevertheless, a particle whip is a dramatic weapon, for when it is about to fire, the monolith will channel its alien energies through its crystal to unleash devastating arcs of antimatter lightning. A single, ear-splitting discharge from the particle whip is enough to reduce tanks to smoldering wrecks and infantry to molecular vapor. The explosions caused by a particle whip will often affect large areas and can cause great damage to infantry and vehicles alike, 
no matter what form of armor provides their protection. Like the Imperium's lance weapons. Necron starships have also been armed with extremely large variants of the particle whip. These ship-sized particle whips are used during void combat to launch devastating strikes upon enemy vessels, often one-shotting them in the first place. More of which can be read directly below. For a long time, despite being several orders of magnitude bigger than the particle shredder, the particle whip only improved over the shredder in S and AP by one pip. Come 9th edition and the particle whip has now been hitting the gym, cause Christ, at S12 and AP3, you could quite literally whip multiple tech units into space dust. Tesla Destructor. Like its smaller brethren, the Tesla Destructor is a form of Necron Tesla weapon that unleashes a heavy blast of living Viridian lightning that crackles from foe to foe after hitting its target, charring flesh and melting armor. Tesla bolts feed off the energy released by the destruction, and the lightning discharge becomes more furious with every fresh arc, moving as if it had a mind of its own. In some cases, these energetic projectiles have even been observed to crack ceramides and plasteel. A Tesla Destructor is the largest known type of Tesla weapon, and such is the shocking rapidity of its fire that the lightning unleashed is capable of leaping from target to target so quickly that they are unable to ground themselves. A single direct hit from a Tesla Destructor might incapacitate an entire squad, leaving a trail of smoldering carnage across a broad swathe of the battlefield behind them. Due to a Tesla Destructor's large size, it is most commonly found mounted on vehicular platforms. The Tesla Destructor is again, another point of strength and twice as many shots compared to the Tesla Cannon. The Annihilation Barge, Night Scythe, and Doom Scythe all mount a twin-linked set of them for vaporizing infantry blobs. Tesla Sphere. A Tesla Sphere is a form of Necron Tesla weapon that unleashes a bolt of living lightning that crackles from foe to foe after hitting its target, charring flesh and melting armor. A Tesla Sphere is an arcane Tesla weapon only found mounted on Necron obelisks. Each obelisk will be armed with four such weapons around its hull capable of defending it against anything that enters the airspace around the war machine. Tesla Spheres have an extremely high rate of fire, even more so than a Tesla Destructor, and possess a similar range and degree of power output per shot to most other large Tesla weapons. Tesla bolts feed off the energy released by the destruction, and the lightning discharge becomes more furious with every fresh arc, almost as if moving with a mind of its own. Also as of the Skiterii Codex the Adeptus Mechanicus is heavily implied to have Nikola Tesla's preserved skull which they occasionally carry into battle to shoot lightning out of, despite the fact that Nikola Tesla was cremated and his ashes put into a gold-plated sphere. Aeonic Orb. The actual orb of the Aeonic Orb. This orb is an entire star shrunk via spatial manipulation and is all around, a batchet insane piece of war gear. An Aeonic Orb is usually crafted from the living metal of the Necron's own undying bodies, Necrodermis. This was the only material that has the properties both strong enough to withstand the gravitational force generated by the fragment of a star and regenerates fast enough to self-repair from the raging plasma of that star. The orb can open a small corridor, allowing the raw heat of a star to be projected over a wide area. You can imagine the results from that proverbial ass rape. The Imperium boasts that its plasma weapons fire miniature suns, the Necrons laugh at that pitiful notion. Also, if that containment field is destroyed, the entire star goes out, on top of a planet. The orb has two firing modes. Solar Flare, an artificial solar flare, the solar flare is a more direct, anti-armor approach with long range. The damage is unmatched making void shields roll for critical existence failures and giving emperor titans a new asshole. But such a blast will force the orb to recharge for a significant period of time before it can be unleashed again. Solar Burst, the more anti-infantry and anti-horde approach. This is a less damaging, shorter ranged plasma blast otherwise identical to the full solar flare. However, the solar burst's beam will sweep across a wider area as a result of its greater accuracy and the increased second order radiation effects. Good for roasting tyranids on a Sunday morning. Gravitational. Singularity generator. The Necrons too have grav weaponry on their own and theirs are obviously far and beyond the technological capability of the Imperiums. The singularity generator is essentially the Necron equivalent of the graviton singularity cannon. 
Singularity generators are weapons mounted on the Necron Seraptic Walker. These heavy weapons create miniature quantum singularities, drawing in nearby matter before collapsing in a catastrophic implosion that damages anything nearby. Dimensional. Transdimensional projector. The big cheddar of the transdimensional beamer. Transdimensional projectors are Necron heavy weapons attached to the giant fuck off Seraptic spider heavy construct. Like their smaller brethren, these weapons are capable of shifting matter into a pocket dimension, dooming them to a terrible fate, of course its effects are much larger and cover a wider radius. It seems to be located underneath the even bigger synaptic obliterator, acting as something like a wondrous long secondary weapon to deal with multiple targets that the synaptic obliterator may have missed. Transdimensional Abductor. The big cheese of the transdimensional family. The transdimensional abductor are mounted on a star store, which are large Necron buildings designed to buff nearby Necrons. The transdimensional abductor is, therefore, considered as a self-defense weapon for the star still and its rules seem to support that theory. You see, unlike the more Chad transdimensional projector, the transdimensional abductor is far more dispersed with a pitifully short range for a weapon of such caliber and size. Other. Synaptic obliterator. The big daddy of the synaptic disintegrator. Instead of merely giving a single target a pronounced brain aneurysm, the synaptic obliterator does it on a dozen targets at once, and these targets just so happen to be the size of Imperial Knights. These weapons are Necron heavy weapons attached to the scary spider-esque Seraptic constructs. The synaptic obliterators are a particularly fearsome Necron weapon which, upon being trained upon an enemy, unleash a concentrated burst of subatomic particles capable of tearing apart the molecular bonds within their target cells or structure. Atomizer Beam Lance The Atomizer Beam Lance is the primary and only ranged weapon for the Canoptic Reanimators. Not much is really known from this weapon other than the fact that it can disintegrate its foes. Which isn't really telling much since every Necron weapon disintegrate their foes. So whether it is a form of gorse, particle or in mythic weapon, we have no fucking clue. However, it could also heal back down Necrons, so it might be some sort of molecular manipulator. It does have 4 orbs of doom however, so it at the very least has a good rate of fire. Ship weapons. Directed energy. Lightning arc. The lightning arc, like every goddamned forsaken weapon with the word lightning in its name, is actually not a lightning weapon. So that means it has no relations with Tesla weapons nor arc weaponry. Rather, it is a weapon that stores solar energy before it is released as a wave of living energy tendrils which envelop targets, probing for any points of weakness. Yes, I know, that sounds dangerously close to a C-Tan but it functions similarly to an Aeonic Orb insofar as both weapons using the energy of a star. However, the way it functions is just... weird. Fortunately, in terms of actual gameplay, in Battlefleet Gothic, Armada II, the Lightning Arc is one of the primary weapons used by Necron starships. It is by far the most common of these naval weapons and it is a rough analog of a macro cannon battery. Being the Necron's run-of-the-mill starship weapon, Lightning arcs are found on either side of the ship's hull. Like all Necron starship weapons, lightning arcs essentially bypass all forms of shields including void shields to get into the soft and juicy bits. However, because of its function, it affects the entirety of the ship as the quasi-living solar energy attacks weak points of the target. This makes the lightning arc, like its namesake, quite good at creating attack chains from one targeted ship to the next nearest one. Particle Whip Launcher. Whilst the Particle Whip is only affordable for the largest and most powerful of Necron ground vehicles and even then, they could only hold one, in space. On the other hand, Necron Void ships are large enough that this becomes a standard issue anti-ship weapon. Akin to a Lance weapon, the Particle Whip Launcher is the Necron's run of the mill anti-armor starship weapon found in heavily armed ships in the Necron fleets. They behave almost exactly the same as the ground base particle whip, just on a bigger scale. Due to their nature of being well. Necrons. Particle whip launchers essentially bypass all forms of shields including void shields to get into the soft and juicy bits. It is by far the largest particle weapon if the scaling is of any indication. In Battlefleet Gothic, 
Armada My Eye, the crunch is pretty similar to the fluff. It is one of the best anti-ship weapon for the sheer fact that it ignores shields and just goes straight into punching through the armored hulls of a ship. As you can imagine, a couple of these things are a bane to all things Tyranid. You ain't gonna get back those biomas if they are zapped out of existence. These weapons are often fired simultaneously, like lance weapons, but more awesome. Non-firearm weapons. Malay weapons. Setan phase weapons. Ekrons don't have that much in the power weapon armory, before 9e that is, but they don't need to when they have blades that can bypass all forms of armor to get deep into the juicy bits. This is where Setan phase weapons come in. A Setan phase weapon, also known as a fractal edged weapon, is based around a metal blade of unknown composition that, through the use of highly advanced Necron physics, is capable of phasing through any object irrespective of its physical properties. Energy shields, armor and even demonic bodies are of no defense against a phase weapon. Due to its name, the Setan phase weapon is both a rare and powerful tool of use. However, as a Setan's raw substance is made of the same alloy and has the same properties, Attacking a Setan with a Setan phase weapon disarms the attacker, as the metal becomes a part of the Setan's body. In one instance, a Kalidus assassin attacked an Imperial planetary governor, only to have her Setan phase weapon absorbed into the governor and become a part of his body. This planetary governor was most likely the Setan shard called the Deceiver in another of its myriad disguises. Despite its Xeno's origin and questionable heretical nature, the Imperium of Man have taken an interest in these weapons. Whilst they don't know how this thing works, they do understand how useful it is to have a blade that ignores all types of armor, so they gave it to their best. The most notable users of Setan phase weapons are the elite officio assassinorum assassins of the Calidus Temple in employ of the Imperial Inquisition. The Death Watch utilize a similar weapon, known as a Xenophase Blade an ancient and barely understood artifact weapon who some believe has its origins amongst long defeated Xenos dynasties, though speaking of its history has long been forbidden on pain of excruciation. Whether this type of weapon is one in the same, is not currently known. Imperium. Setan Phase Blade. The most common Imperium Phase weapon is the blade found on those sexy, polymorphic ladies. It is believed that the first phase blade was found on one of the long dead worlds of the Setan. Excavations by the Adeptus Mechanicus uncovered numerous artifacts of extremely advanced technology, but of their makers, there was no evidence. Each individual phase blade utilized by a Calidus assassin is optimized to reflect their user's favored combat stance and personal strengths, but they all take the form of an elongated punch dagger. Their deadly blades are thought to utilize the lost Xenos technology of the Setan, though the Calidus Temple keeps their nature a close secret. The blade of the phase weapon is unusual in its ability to phase in and out of real space by molecular realignment, allowing it to plunge clean through armor, flesh and bone as though they were not there at all. Xenophase Blade. Unlike the Setan phase blade, the Xenophase blade is designed like a traditional single-bladed sword. Thus, there is very little need for practice when it comes to the utilization of these weapons. Xenophase blades are a type of weapon used by the Death Watch. These weapons are ancient and barely understood artifacts. Xenos in origin, they ripple with a molecular realignment field that allows it to cleave through force fields and metaphysical wards easily. Speaking of the origins of these weapons is forbidden within the Death Watch under penalty of excruciation and recycling. It is unknown if it has the same problem of being absorbed by a Setan when used against them. Whether this type of weapon is one in the same, is not currently known, although most in TG says yes due to the blatantly Necron appearance. On tabletop, Xenoface blades are basically power swords that force a roll on inval and saves, as they have the ability to teleport past armor. Needless to say, that makes them extremely invaluable weapons. Necron. War Scythe. The most common type of Necron close combat weapon. A war scythe is Necron weapon composed of Necrodermis and similar to the phase blades used by the Imperium. War scythes are used by Necron overlords, Necron lords, Lich goods, and Pariahs Balam. It is of a similar design to the Staff of Light, although it has no ranged attack, didn't stop some Necrons from putting a gorse flare on top of it, and is more formidable in combat. The Pariahs, when they still exist, However, 
carry a model of Warsi that has a gorse blaster built into it. They are made of the same living metal as their ships and bodies and can carry itself effortlessly through all types of armor, including heavy energy fields, thanks due to its own entropic field generator. A well-directed attack can take off the end of a Lemon Russ battle tank or scythe open the side of a bunker. A Warsythe's power core blazes with the heraldic color of its wielder's Necron dynasty. A curious side effect of the Warsythe's power field is to render the weapon almost impossible to destroy. There are several well-documented instances of Warsythe surviving direct hits from Lus cannons, and even from turbo lasers, with little harm to show for it. Unfortunately, this protection does not extend to the wielder, and it is quite common for a Warsythe to survive a battle where its master does not. Hyperface Weapons Hyperface Sword A Hyperface Sword is a Necron melee weapon whose energy blade vibrates across dimensional states and can easily slice through armor and flesh to sever the vital organs within. A Hyperface Sword can be considered an advanced type of power weapon. Hyperface Swords are found exclusively as part of the armories of Necron Royals, such as Necron Overlords, Necron Lords, Necron Destroyer Lords, and their favored Lich Goods are also found on Deathwatch Watch Sergeants, oddly enough. Hyperface Thresher. The Chinese cleavers of hyperface weapons. The annoyingly named Hyperface Thresher, seriously why not just call it Thresher? Because it keeps with the farming theming of these weapons without being misconstrued for one of the various other things Thrashers could be, is a big boned cousin of the conventional hyperface sword that could shatter bone and slice through armor like Swiss cheese. These Hyperface Thresher are one of the two primary weapons of the Scorpec Destroyer. They are always wielded in pairs and are permanently attached to the Scorpec Destroyer, so it could never be unarmed in battle. It is so named the Thresher, because the Scorpec Destroyer wielding it turns into a walking meat blender. Fuck subtlety and elegance, the Necrons get shit done and if it means thrashing around these swords like a spastic Asimo, then so be it. Hyperface Reap Blade. The Hyperface Thresher's bigger brother. The Hyperface Reap Blade closely resembles the Thresher, except on a much larger scale. The Hyperface Reap Blade is so big that it needs to be wielded by two hands. The Reap Blade is one of the two primary weapons of the Scorpec Destroyer and the Aphidian Destroyer. Like the Thresher, the Reap Blade is permanently attached to the Scorpec Destroyer, so it could never be unarmed in battle. It was notable as being basically, the mascot weapon of Warhammer 40, 0009th edition and the Necrons in general, as it was famously seen being used to duke it out with a cannon assumed with a power sword during the 9th edition trailer. Hyperface Glaive. The staff cousin of the Hyperface family. The Hyperface Glaive is a large and long two-handed power weapon wielded by Necron overlords to spank a bitch if need be. It is an optional weapon and is dependent on whether the overlord likes to go in close and dirty. If not, then he she can opt for a necron staff weapon to pew pew enemies from a distance. Due to its sheer size, a hyperface glaive could easily cleave a tank in two. Moreover, it has a smaller blade on the other end, to ensure a nasty surprise if the overlord finds him herself in a sword fighting stalemate. Hyperface Harvester. The big chungus of hyperface weapons. The Hyperface Harvester is an enormous hyperface weapon wielded by Necron Scorpec Lords. These absolute units of a weapon is wielded single-handedly due to the sheer size of the Scorpec Lord and is one of its primary weapons. Like the Hyperface Glaive, the blade of the Hyperface Harvester could cleave tanks easily in two. Its thickness also makes the blade incredibly heavy, crushing and bending lesser swords from sheer weight alone. Miscellaneous Weapons the Necrons possess highly advanced close combat weapons made out of exotic materials such as Necrodermis for example. Mana Molecular Proboscis. A very weird weapon. The Mana Molecular Proboscis is the primary equipment used by Necron Plasmacytes. Though fairly harmless by itself, the weapon can inject nearby Necron Destroyer Cultists with a chemical that enhances their nihilistic rage. Why the Necrons decided that was a good idea, we have no idea. To give you some context, it would be like the equivalent of the Imperial Guard injecting space marines with Nurgle's rot. Scythed limbs. He little fiddler to the flensing claws. Scythed limbs are the primary close combat dominant of the Cryptothralls. These? Well. 
Scythed limbs are made from sharpened necrodermis and other exotic materials to create a sharp blade that could regenerate any wear and tear from repeated use. Flensing Claw. The primary weapon of both the Scorpec Lord and Flayed Ones. These are the scythed limbs bigger brothers and are used, as its name implies, to skin their foes and wear them like a Halloween decoration. Flensing claws are incredibly sharp and intricate weapons that are essentially Edward Scissorhands on crack. Necrons with the Flayer virus often mutate into having these, although those from the Destroyer cults are known to have one too. Void Blade. Somewhat of a oddity even for the Necrons. A Void Blade is a form of Necron melee weapon, whose gleaming black edge flickers in and out of existence, causing molecular bonds to sever in any foe unfortunate enough to be struck and potentially causing a chain reaction of atomic disintegration. A Void Blade is capable of piercing any form of infantry armor when this occurs, and its strike has a similar effect to the entropic bite of a Canoptex Scarab upon infantry and vehicle armor. Void Blades are weapons found almost exclusively as part of the armories of Necron Royals like Necron Overlords, Necron Lords and Necron Destroyer Lords. However, Triarch Praetorians also often pair a Void Blade with a Particle Caster as an alternative armament to their usual two-handed Rod of Covenant, whilst Canoptic Acanthrides have Void Blades as tail-mounted close combat weapons. Grenades and Explosives. Counter Temporal Nanomine. Counter Temporal Nanomine. The only known Necron grenade mine. Counter temporal nanomines are a Necron cryptic device. Released from hive gems about the bearer's person, a swarm of nanoscarabs sweep out and lace the ground before them with microscopic temporal charges. Foes advancing into this invisible minefield find reality shattering and glitching around them. They are used by chronomancers. Death spheres. Death spheres are the primary armament of the Necron Night Shroud Bomber. A relic from the days of the war in heaven, a death sphere is a containment vessel imprisoning a fragment of antimatter like those of a particle weapon. The warhead is kept phased out of the material universe until the death sphere is launched from the night shroud and detonates, unleashing an energy blast that annihilates all that it touches. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.